maybe. Hello, welcome back everyone. So we are gonna pick up uh, from the last lecture we were, where we were discussing uh, the side distance to see around obstruction on horizontal curves. So that's the point that we, are, we needed to start again. Uh, one thing I would recommend is that sometimes the quality of the text that you see here might not be uh, the best quality. So your best bet is to have the FE reference manual along with you so that you can follow along and you, you know exactly the text I'm referring to on the camera here. And uh, I'm also going to do, I'm going to stop video from this main device and then we can, we can start talking about this. Okay, so the topic for today is the side distance to start to see around the obstruction. And the way this works is that you're talking about this type of horizontal curve. And this is page number 166 of your FE reference manual in, within the transportation section. And in that page, we, were, we discussed how the geometry of the horizontal curves, these are circular curves, this is a circular section. And then we had a formula for M, capital M, which is called the middle ordinate. And the formula for M was M equal to R times one minus cosine I over two, where I is the angle subtended. Okay. To derive the formula that we have for horizontal side distance, to derive the formula for the horizontal side distance, what we try to do, what we try to do is uh, we try to figure out what should be the site offset. So basically, this is the horizontal site of sight line offset, and the way that works is the way, the, way, the way that offset works is that. So today I'm doing the product placement for our actual the actual department that I work for and not for the hotel. Um, but anyway, so this is, let's say this is the horizontal curve you're talking about. And let's, let's kind of make it into a two lane road. So let's say this is the solid center line. You're not allowing the lane change. And then you have the, this is the inside of the curve. And then this is the outside of the curve. Okay. And then let's say this is the center line of the lane itself. And then we try to do all of our calculations, all of our calculations from the center line of the inner lane. Because remember, the inner lane has a smaller radius. That means it's a sharper curve. So if you design for that curve, you are doing, uh, you are doing the most more conservative thing. So as you can see, <clears throat> so what I'm going to draw, try to draw here is I'm gonna draw a version of the figure. I'm gonna draw a version of the curve, a circular curve. That is the limiting case. Basically, if you are at this point on the curve and maybe the curve goes a little bit longer, the actual curve is a little bit longer. But what I'm gonna to try to draw is a limiting case of this curve so that when your driver eye is here, they're exactly, their line of sight goes up to that next point. So obviously, if there is any obstruction located any point beyond this line, let's say if there was an obstruction located right here, it would block the view of what's going on around the bend. So what we try to do is we try to design a situation where the obstruction is located right on the edge of that line, right on the edge. So it could be a corner of the building, it could be edge of the tree, whatever it might be. We assume that this is located right at the edge. So, so you can see that the distance that you can see is this much. So you, you can basically see this far around the bend. So you can see the other side of the cord uh, of the curve here. And if you see something here, let's say there is a stopped vehicle or there is a, you know, I don't know, dead animal or whatever, and you need to stop for that, you can apply your brake here and you should be able to see all of this distance so the limiting case occurs when this length is exactly equal to the required stopping side distance. So, so this, when this length is SSD, when this length is equal to stopping side distance for the given speed, that's when the limiting case occurs. So basically what you're saying is that we are figuring out what is the horizontal offset from this point, and that's what the formula describes. 
So this is what the formula describes. The formula said HSO, horizontal site offset HSO is equal to the radius of the curve. And then we use the radius of the curve to be the radius uh, from here, radius from the inside lane. And then you, you basically apply this, the same geometry that formula that we had on the main sheet, M equal to R times one minus cosine I over two. So basically if you apply that same formula, you can com convert that formula into this. And you could probably see the format of the HSO R times one minus cosine 28.65 S over R. This S over R is, is basically a measure of the angle. And then that has been converted uh, into, into radian. So this is, this is why that formula looks like slightly different, but it's basically the same thing. Horizontal side M equal to R one minus cosine I over two. So that formula has been converted to account for the fact that if you talk about the limiting case, this distance has to be the stopping site distance. And then this is the HSO. And then this, this is the uh, critical radius. Now, sometimes the problem, and then maybe we'll try to solve a problem like this. Sometimes the problem might be described slightly differently. You might have multiple lanes. Instead of having a two lane road, you might have two lanes on one side of the road. And that in that case, the radius that you use in this formula would have to be worked out to be the uh, the center line of the inner lane, innermost lane. So the R in this is basically we, in some textbooks you might see R as R sub V, which is the critical radius. Critical radius. And that radius is measured from center line of the inside lane. And we will try to work out some examples that kind of relate with that. And we'll make sure that we are using that formula correctly. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind as you're reviewing this. Okay, so that's that's the HSO uh, issue. So we have basically covered pretty much all of highway design of the transportation portion in our, except for the problems, we will work out a problem in a future session, but that covers the horizontal or highway design portion of the, you know, of the FE manual. Now I wanna move on to traffic operations. I wanna move on to traffic operations and traffic operation portion basically is deals with just a specific case here. And that portion is right above on the page, same page on page 165 of your traffic manual. And then this is what it looks like. Now what this, what the traffic operation portion is about is about the fundamental relationships of how the traffic flows. Remember that they are only focusing here on uninterrupted flow, the flow that happens on freeways. The flow that happens on freeways is designed to be uninterrupted because it's not, doesn't mean that you'll never have to slow down or stop because obviously if you're driven in uh, on freeways or if you've been in a car on freeways in any urban area, you know that freeways do tend to slow down. They slow down all the time. The, the fact is though, that a lot of times those freeways have to slow down because there is congestion. There is no design stop sign or design traffic signal on the freeways. I mean, by definition, if you have a freeway, it cannot have any of those types of obstructions at all. So this is traffic operations and this specifically relates with what we call uninterrupted flow. So what are some one one of what is the fundamental relationship of the uninterrupted flow? It is Q equal to KV. Okay, flow equal to uh, K times V, where Q Q is the flow rate. Okay, flow rate, and this is measured typically in, and you can see it. The units are very important here. The basic units are vehicles per hour, vehicles per hour. <clears throat> and then sometimes you might do this operation for per lane basis as well. So you could define it on per lane basis, or you could define it just, if you wanna just aggregate all lanes together, 
you can define it as vehicles per hour. Now, I just not happened to notice that at least on this text, there is a little typo here. It says vehicles per mile per lane on the flow units. Actually, that should be vehicles per hour per lane because that's the units of the flow. Now, essentially what it's measuring is that if you're standing on the side of the road and you're counting cars, how many cars would you count passing through a point in one hour period? Okay, so that's basically what the definition of flow rate is. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there is a related parameter, it's K. The, it, the, is density. Density, if you recall, de the definition of density from your chemistry possibly, uh, in organic chem chemistry, it's how closely packed things are. And the idea here is the same. If the cars are closer together, that means the freeway is going through a very dense situation. So you have more density. And if the cars are not as closely packed together, that means they have more spacing between them, then the density is lower. So how do you measure density? What is the units for dens density? It's vehicles per mile per lane. You can define it again on a vehicle per mile basis, or you can define it as vehicle per mile per lane basis. And this charts here are using the per lane basis, but I would not be surprised if, if there are problems that, that deal with vehicle per mile basis, aggregating all the lanes. But these relationships don't change based on that, okay? But you just have to be consistent. For example, if you're measuring density per lane, you wanna measure your flow per, per lane as well. And if you're measuring your density uh, per lane, and then your, uh, uh, then your uh, flow has to be measured per lane as well. So once you've figured out the speed and flow, I mean density and flow, the one last one that remains is what we call the speed. Speed is measured in miles per hour, is miles per hour, okay? Because if you do Q divided by K, if you do Q divided by K, vehicle per hour per lane divided by vehicles per mile per lane, the way the units shake out is it, the units become in miles per hour. So you could figure out the value for the unit, the, the measurement is used V, so I should probably be consistent here and say V is the speed and it's measured in miles per hour. One more thing that is a little bit of a distinction here that is that, that could, it's gonna be useful if you focus more on transportation side of things in your civil engineering practice, but, but maybe not as required here, that this V is what we call the space mean speed. So the speed that we use here in these charts, in all of these charts, is what we call the space mean speed. That, that just means that you, you cannot measure it the same way that you would measure the flow rate, for example. And I wanna just explain this process because then it will be very clear as to where this formula comes from. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So let's focus a little bit on this. I'll be able to refer to the charts here. So where does this formula Q equal to KV comes from? Okay. So think, as I mentioned, let's say if you're sitting on the side of the road and, and you're counting cars here as they pass by this particular point. Okay. And you also know that this is like a steady state flow of traffic where there is like, you know, going back miles and miles, there is, there is cars that, that might be out there. And it's a consistent density along the road. And the density on this section of the road is K, vehicles per mile. And again, you could do vehicles per mile per lane, that's okay. But then you'll be counting cars per lane as well. Okay, so let's say, um, you, and you're counting cars, and in one hour, you counted small Q number of cars, Q vehicles per hour, Per lane. Okay, so let's say you counted Q cars in one hour and the density within, let's say, any given segment of the highway is vehicle per mile uh, per lane K, and it's, uh, it's represented by the value K. Now, and, and let's say they are traveling on average, there are all these vehicles. If you take one mile 
segment of the road and you average out the speed of the cars, and that's why it is space mean speed. If you average out the speed of the cars that are within this segment, and that speed is defined as V miles per hour. So one, one, one interesting way to think about is, is that how many count cars will you count in one hour? If the cars are on average traveling in V miles per hour in that segment, and your density is K vehicles per mile per lane. Okay. If the density is K vehicles per mile per lane, and let's, let's start giving them some values here. So let's say the density is 20 vehicles per mile per lane and they're all traveling at 40 miles per hour. So my question is, how many cars will you count in one hour period? If you stand here on this point and you start counting, how many cars will you count? It's actually easy to sort of visualize it. That means if the cars are traveling at 40 miles an hour, okay, so that means if you count for one hour, cars that are in the region of 40 miles from that point will be able to make to this point. If they're traveling at 40 miles per hour, even cars that are 40 miles behind this point, even the cars that are 40 miles behind this point will be able to make this point in an hour. How many cars would there be like that? Because we know that there are 20 vehicles per mile per lane. So that means 40 times 20, that means your Q will be 800 vehicles per hour per lane. And how am I getting that 800? I'm getting 800 by 40 times 20. And that's exactly the relationship that we learned about. And that's also given in the manual right here, Q equal to KB. And where does it come from? It comes from this sort of a steady state flow assumption. And that assumption is surprisingly robust but just one thing to, to, to think about, and it's again, it's not something that might be relevant for FE, but always this space, speed is space mean speed because you wanna look at speed of the vehicles that are occupying, this speed is space mean speed because you wanna look at speed of the vehicles that are occupying a segment of the road and not necessarily the vehicles that are passing this point because sometimes it could be that the vehicles that pass this point are actually gonna be the faster vehicle. Okay, so that's why you want to be careful. And that type of speed, if you stand on the side of the road and measure the speed of the cars as they pass by and average them, that speed is what we call, uh, in contrast, is called time mean speed. Okay, and we don't use time means, it's called time mean speed, but we don't use this speed. We don't use this speed in the formulas that are shown. Okay, so the for, in the formula that are shown, we use the space mean speed because we don't want to have the faster vehicles that reach this point faster to be overrepresented in our calculation. So that's why we always use the space mean speed. Okay. So what I will uh, now let's go back to this chart. What we have talked about so far is the equation that relate all three of these fundamental parameters: Q equal to K times V, flow rate equal to speed times density. Okay. Now, <clears throat> because flow rate is equal to speed times density, if you know the relationship between any two of these parameters, any two of these parameters, then you could derive the relationship between the other parameters because you know this fundamental relationship that is always applicable. And the charts shown here show one special kind of relationship. We call this the Green Shields model. We call this the Green Shields model. So the Green Shield model, it defines, so Green Shield model is the one that defines the relationship between speed and density, how speed and density are related. Now you can think about how speed and density are related by thinking about if what should happen to speed as density goes up, right? If the road becomes more crowded, then your speed will actually come down. And that is represented by a line of negative slope where density is on the x-axis and speed is on the y-axis. 
And as density increases, speed comes down. So it's a negative linear relationship. And if you assume that negative linear relationship and you take the middle point of that relationship, okay, you get the speed at that density. And if you, so I'm gonna just kind of show you some quick examples of this. So let's say your speed density relationship looks like something like this. S is equal to S naught or SF rather. So let's use the notation SF. So that's your free flow speed, the constant term, or you can see the y-intercept in our equation. SF plus B times density value K. Okay, so let's, let's kind of think about this in, in those terms. S is equal to SF plus B times K, where SF and B are constant parameters of the relationship. Where SF and B are constant parameters of the relationship. So what happens is that you can figure out what is the SF value here. So SF value on the chart SF value on the chart is, is right here. SF value on the chart is on the top of the graph and you can, I know it's hard to see on the camera, but if you have your notes and you're following along, this value is represented at SF. You can figure out when the value of this relationship will be equal to SF, when the K value is essentially zero because on Y axis, the X coordinate is zero. So that essentially means that if I plug in K equal to zero, I'll end up with SF value. <clears throat> so if I plug in K equal to zero, I'll end up with S equal to SF. And this SF is what we call the free flow speed. It is the speed when density is close to zero. Okay? And that's what we call the free flow speed. Now, as density increases, the speed values start to go down from SF. It starts to decrease from there. And this is what this representation is. Okay. Now let's assume, let's assume that this is your given relationship. So now you want to find out, okay, what is my speed flow relationship might look like? So if I want to figure out, okay, what is my speed flow relationship? Or what is my speed flow model? If I'm assuming that this is my green shields model, This is my Green Shields model, and it is a linear relationship between speed and density, and that relates speed with density. What does it look like for speed flow? Now, remember, we already know that Q is equal to KV. That's our fundamental relationship that's always applicable, regardless of what you assume for speed density. So if I plug in, and I should probably so they call it SF now, <clears throat> Q equal to KV. So I, I should probably be consistent. I should probably just call it V relationship here. So I'm sorry about that. Like V should be the speed value. And I'll, I'll just still use SF for my speed flow because that will be consistent with the, with the chart that they have. And this is important because you need to understand these relationship. Different textbooks use different notations for these values. And that's why it's easy to get a little bit confused just like I, I, I sort of tweak those uh, notations here, but just make sure that you represent speed with V. I'm still calling the free flow speed SF as my parameter and then B times K. But let's say if now you want to relate speed with flow, so you still want to keep V and you still want to keep Q. So what you need to do is you need to remove this K from your model. You want to remove this K from your model because you want to only keep Q and V. So what I can do is, because I know V is equal to, according to Green Shields, is SF plus B times K. Okay. So I can do is like I can solve for K here. And K will be equal to, in this case, 1 over B times V minus SF. I'm sorry, is that right? V minus SF. One over B. Yeah, that's right. Okay. 
Now, if that is the case, I can, if I know this is what is K is, I can plug that back into this. I can get Q equal to one over B, V minus SF times V. Now you can see that this is what the relationship looks like, but the basic thrust of this relationship is that this is relationship, you have Q on the left-hand side, one over B, V minus SF, and you're gonna multiply this whole thing with V. So you're going to end up with a term with V squared. So if you have Q related to V squared, what kind of parabola, I mean, what kind of relationship would that make? That kind of relationship would look like, would look something like this. Okay, would look something like this. And it's going to be a parabolic relationship. Okay, it's a parabolic relationship. And this parabolic relationship is very interesting and useful because it has Q on the X axis and speed on the Y axis. And this is the one where I pointed out the error. It should be vehicles per hour per lane for the flow rate units. But this is, this is the flow rate going up like that. Now, if you look at this parabola, this is the point where the flow is maximum. Flow is maximum. And this is what we call the capacity of the roadway section. This is the maximum flow rate a roadway can discharge. How many vehicles can you push through in one hour period? This is your maximum flow rate. And this is, corresponds to what we call uh, VM, the speed corresponding to uh, uh, VM. And then this is called D naught. Now there is a lot of confusing sort of parameterization here because they are representing that as VM. And it's a flow value. It's a flow value. So this is the maximum flow rate, okay? And then when they project it onto the speed, they still call it S naught, which is the speed at which maximum flow occurs, okay? And if you assume this linear relationship, there is a very useful, just by looking at the chart, you can tell that if you know the free flow speed, and you can do some cal calculus here to figure it out if you wanna derive it, but for the FE exam purposes, it's very easy for you to figure out if you look carefully at this diagram, S naught, the speed at which the flow becomes maximum is equal to half of the value of the free flow speed. So if you have a freeway that operates on a free flow speed is 70 miles an hour, and they ask you what will be the value of S naught, which is defined as optimum speed or the speed at which maximum flow rate occurs, you can just do 70 divided by two or whatever is your free flow speed divided by two. So, so if your free flow speed was 70 miles an hour, your optimum speed or the speed at which the maximum flow occurs would be 35 miles an hour. And they denote that with S naught. And what is, the, what is the actual value of the flow rate? It's denoted as VM and VM is what we call capacity. Now you could do the same thing. You could derive a similar parabolic relationship between flow and density. And they draw that here. And here the density is on the, x-axis and flow rate is on the y-axis and they draw this chart right below that to the same scale on, on D. And if you look at the midpoint of this relationship now, it's called D naught, which we call the optimum density or the density at which maximum flow rate occurs. Okay. And again, this is also related to the density, maximum possible density. And what is that? Remember, maximum possible density is a bad thing because that's what we call the jam density, DJ. It's referred to as DJ. And you can find the optimum density by doing half of the jam density. So let's say there is a freeway for which the jam density is 120 vehicles per mile per lane. And that's a little bit of a high value, but let's go with that for now. Let's say the jam density is 120. You can get the optimum density to be 120 divided by two. So that means the maximum flow rate will occur at half that value. Okay, and these relationship of like, you know, just being able to half the free flow speed or just being able to half the jam density to get the optimal speed and optimum density respectively, that only works, that only works if you're dealing with green shields model. And that's the only thing the FE exam manual wants you to deal with. There are other relationship which we're not gonna get into right now. But if you assume that the speed and density are linearly related with a negative sloped line, Okay, with a negative slope line, then you can assume that, uh, <clears throat> that you can basically solve problems pretty easily 
where you can find the optimum speed by just halving the speed, uh, halving the free flow speed, and just by halving the jam density, you can get the optimal density. And remember, this is what the flow looks like. Okay. Now, one thing is that the free flow speed happens when the density is zero, when there is no cars on the road, that's when free flow speed occurs. And when jam density occurs, what happens? So if you project this point onto this graph, if you take the jam density graph over here, what's happening to speed? The speed is zero. Basically, nobody's moving. What happens to flow rate at jam density? If you project it point this way, you can see the flow rate is also zero because nobody's moving. And if you're observing car passing a point, that number will also go down to zero. So you will have zero value for flow rate and zero value for speed at jam density. <clears throat> and then, so, so that's basically some of the parameters listed here. Remember now, when they talk about maximum flow, they denote it with V sub M. So again, V they were using for speed before in this formula, Q equal to KV, but now V sub M is maximum flow rate. So just kind of be careful about those little uh, details. But as long as you understand these relationship between speed, flow, and density, you should, you should generally be okay there. Okay, so I'll take like just one minute break here to, to see if there are any questions. I know we covered a lot of ground with regards to uh, first starting out with the design concepts of the clearance distance. And, and also, uh, we covered the Green Shields model and so forth. So if there are any questions here, I'll be happy to answer them uh, at, at this point. No questions, no questions, I think. Oh. Megan, did you have something else to add? Oh, no, I, I just said we had no questions. Okay, perfect. So that's great. Uh, and then again, some of these things you, you do have to, so learning these things theoretically is fine, fine and good, and, and you have to do that. But the key to really understanding these things is, is working out problems, which I hope to do in, in one of the future sessions uh, about each of these topics. I'm just gonna go, go look over real quick. So we have covered all of these things. So now what I wanna talk about within the transportation realm is the idea, is the idea about the planning portion. And I think that that time that we have left over right now should be just enough for me to cover uh, these planning portions. And then in the next session, what I'll try to do is I will try to work out all the, what I'll try to work out is the issue of uh, <clears throat> the, the gravity model. I mean, I'll try to work out some problems related to all the things that we have covered in the next section. But in the remaining time for this session, uh, I'll try to work out the gravity model and the logic model formulas that are provided on 170. And that's basically what, uh, um, and then the safety portion as well that's remaining. So, so some of those things uh, we should be able to cover somewhat quickly uh, in the remaining time on this session. So the idea of gravity model and the logic model is that these are the terms that relate with aspect of transportation that deals with what we call Planning in general, urban planning or transportation planning in general is where you're looking at how much demand would there be for people to use certain modes, okay? Now, if that is the case, if that is the case, then uh, if you have the demand for planning, urban planning, then what, you're, what you need to do is basically you have, let's say you have a, uh, an urban area, let's say this is like a map of a, town or a region or whatever. And what we divide, we divide these towns into what we call the traffic analysis zones. Okay, so each of these portion of the figure is going to be a traffic analysis zone. And, and these traffic analysis zone, because we want to be able to piggyback on the data collected by Census Bureau, we, we try to tend to coincide these row, uh, these sections of the town or the region into traffic analysis zone. So for example, Cal Poly would be one zone and then certain neighborhoods of, uh, depending upon where the census boundaries are, certain, certain zones of the town where we live in San Luis Obispo would be classified into a zone. And what, we are, what this gravity model tries to do is it tries to look at 
how the trips that start and end at certain zones will be interchanged between each of those zones. So this gravity model is basically the second step, what we call the four step travel demand modeling process. Okay, and this is the second step, what we call the trip distribution. Okay, and this logic model is the third step, which we call the mode choice model. Okay, so what are the first and fourth step? You might be wondering. So that, that is not covered here. It's called trip generation. And the last step is called traffic assignment. Okay, so we are not covering trip generation and traffic assignment here because that's not part of the syllabus for the FE exam at this point. But what we are trying to do is trying to do the analysis for trip gen distribution and mode choice. Okay. So now how do you, so gravity model, if you remember from physics, it defines the, if you recall what gravity model is from physics, it defines the attraction between two masses, right? If the masses are bigger, and they're located close together, they will have more attraction between them than if they are located farther apart or they are very small. Okay? So that's basically the gravity model of the physics, uh, of physics, what you might have learned in, in high school physics or whatever, or whatever. Now the gravity model idea is still the same. So think about these zones on the, on the figure that I've drawn here. So zones that are larger, means that generate overall from the trip generation step, you figure out how many trips are being generated and attracted to each zone in the aggregate, okay? So PI and AJ in this formula are the output from the trip generation step. These two items, PI and AJ, are the output from the trip generation steps, step, and they tell you PI is the total number of trips produced in zone I, and AJ is the total number, total number of trips attracted to zone J. And based on that, you're figuring out how many trips will go from zone I to zone J, okay? So now there might be like many zones in the area, and you can basically figure out for any zone now remember, I is the origin point, the trip where the trips start, and J is the destination point. And again, these subscripts are gonna be very hard to see in the recording. So it's, it's, it'll be helpful if you had the FE reference manual uh, right in front of you, so you can look at and refer to that this term is TIJ, and it's equal to PI, production of zone I. So whatever you're putting first, so this formula could be used to create trips from any zone to any zone. And then PI and AJ will be given in the problem. And FIJ is the friction factor. It's the friction factor and it's basically, FIJ is defined as a value that is inverse function of the travel time between zone I and zone J, okay? So basically what this is assuming is that if two zones have smaller travel time, they will attract more trips between each other. And you can think about this. Uh, let's say you are a shopper at, at Target. I'm doing a lot of product placement here, so maybe I should ask for sponsorship from, from these companies. But let's say you try to shop at Target, and there are two Targets that are located. Okay, One is maybe a Target Supercenter. The other one is maybe a Target Neighborhood Market. So where which Target would you go to might depend on overall, which is a bigger target store, right? So you might actually go to a target store because then you can think that, okay, maybe I can get more stuff. Okay. Or, uh, and then if you need to shop for like, you know, any everyday thing, you, you wanna be able to go to that bigger target because it's just a bigger attractor of trips for you. And that may not always apply, but just, just as an example. And then if the two store target are located, one of them is very close to your house and one of them is farther away from your house, then you will, generally speaking, all things being equal, you'll choose the one that's closer to your house. And that's the part, that's the part of your choice that this FIJ accounts for. It's a value that's an inverse function of the travel time between zone I and zone J. If the two zones are located farther apart, 
they will attract fewer trips between them. If the zones are located closer to each other, they will attract more trips. PI and AJ are basically uh, um, the measure of how large the zones are, how many trips do they produce, P, and how many trips do they attract, A. And, and then KIJ is the socioeconomic adjustment factor for interchange IJ. And, and that would be given, like if there are like, you know, so you could think of it as if people are more employed in a particular neighborhood, they will be making more work trips, for example. So this is KIJ. And all of these things would be given to you in the problem. And your goal will be to just uh, plug those value in, values in uh, and, and be able to estimate TIJ, which is the number of trips that are produced from zone I to zone J. Now, let's say you're given data on two zones. Okay. Let's say you're given the data on two zones, to any given two zones. Let's say you're given data from, from zone two and zone three both. Okay. And you're given P2, A2, P3, A3 as well. Or you're given all of these values and you're given F23 and K23 and then uh, <clears throat> And let's and you will actually need this denominator as well. That denominator is basically summing up the numerator combinations for all possible zone values. So if you want to produce trips between zone two and zone three, it's generally not enough to have data from zone two and three. You will actually need data from all the other zones as well, so that you can figure out the denominator as well. Okay, and then or sometimes you might be given this denominator value directly. So you might be able to plug that in as well. So again, there are some things that you'll need to work out from the examples, but generally speaking, you will need data from more locations, either the denominator as a whole or information to determine this denominator uh, from all the zones that are in, in a study area. Okay. So again, this is something that you'll need to work out with an example and, and we'll work this, we'll, we'll work this out later. Okay. Now, the next part of the problem that we cover is the logit model. The logit model is somebody, something that uh, was uh, actually, somebody won a Nobel Prize, a Nobel Prize in economics for coming up with the logit, logit model to determine how many trips are gonna use a particular mode of travel, okay? So to figure out how many, so how many people are gonna drive, how many people are gonna take the bus, and, and we come up with what we call the likelihood of using a particular mode, and that could be ascertained by, let's say, if you have two trip, two modes, auto and transit, if who will drive and who will take transit, that can be determined by probability of taking auto mode will be e to the power ua, which is utility of taking mode a, divided by e to, e to the power, and this is the exponential constant e, uh, value is close to 2.71, and so basically inverse so it's, it's the inverse function of natural log. So e, e raised to power ua, utility of the auto mode, and e raised to power ut, utility of the transit mode. Okay. Now, how do you define, how, how, how do you estimate the utility of auto mode, automobile mode? The formula for that is right here. Okay. Utility of any mode can be derived by number of attributes that might be given. These attributes could be travel time. If there is a transit, then it could be... Uh, wait time, transfer time, uh, convenience. There could be a lot of different things that might be attribute value, time, cost, and so forth. And AI is the coefficient value for that attribute. And then these values are typically negative because these values are disutilities. So basically what this, these negative values imply is that the travel will always have some kind of a negative utility because people don't travel just for the sake of travel for the most part for the most travel that define how much infrastructure we are going to need. And that's the information planners are looking for. So typically the travel will have a negative utility because people don't say for the travel, for the sake of traveling, they travel because they have to get to work and so on and so forth. So that's why these values are negative. And in general, what will happen is that the automobile travel value would be negative, but the transit value will be even more negative. And then when you plug in the value here, typically you'll get a very high value, especially if you're talking about the United States context, the PA value would be much higher. And then 
if you only have two modes, you could see that PT, the transit value would be e raised to power u, the utility of transit divided by e u a raised to power e u t. So it's basically a mirror image of this formula. And you could also see if there are only two modes, then you could derive PT to be one minus P of A. But remember, it only works if you only have two modes. If you have multiple modes, then you'll have to estimate at least two of those probabilities so that you can subtract from the remaining one if you have three modes, for example. But if you have only two modes, you can derive PA and just simply do one minus PA to get PT. Only works when you have two modes. So I wanna write that down, only works when two more choices available, okay? And then if you wanna, if you have, there are more than two more choices available, you wanna be able to derive E raised to power U of X, and then you basically sum up over all modes, the utility function. So it's basically the same formula, but extended out to multiple modes that might be out there. So this formula applies for multiple modes, And this is the set of formulas that apply if there is only two modes available, automobile and transit, okay? And again, I will work, work out some problems in the future sessions that will be helpful in, in working out the problems. Now, what we have is one last thing that is remaining. So I will just take a one minute quick break and ask uh, my panelists here if there are any questions about any of these things that we discussed. No questions. Okay, thank you, uh, um, thank you uh, for that. And we have one more thing remaining. And what I wanna do is, uh, maybe it'll take me like about 10 minutes to complete. So hopefully I can, I can wrap this up. I have some time and I, I know if my student panelists have some uh, break at the, at the start of the hour, feel free to leave the meeting and, and that's okay. But I just need to cover the two aspects that are remaining now that relate with, uh, with traffic safety and I should be able to wrap that up in next uh, 15 minutes or so. So I will just go ahead and get started. If my panelists need to leave, I completely understand. And uh, I will just continue the discussion on traffic safety. And that will basically wrap up the transportation portion other than the pavement design. Uh, but, but what I wanna do is I wanna work out all the problems on this planning and operations and design side of things first, and then we'll move on to the pavement section. So in the next session, I'll try to work out some problems related to this. Okay, so the traffic safety, this is our last topic for transportation. And this is something that has become more and more important because more and more agencies are now dealing with traffic safety at the planning level. We almost thought of in, in, in yester years, we almost always thought that if we took care of the design aspects, Right. For example, if we provided adequate sight distances, if we provided enough lane width, and if we provided enough shoulder width and all that, essentially we would be able to provide a safe experience for the road. But obviously we know that, that not to be the case. You could design the roads to completely to standards, but you'll still end up with crashes on the road. Okay? You'll still end up with a lot of crashes on the road. Now, so how do you actually account for that? How do you account for the substantive safety and not just make sure that the nominal safety is provided for, for, for by adhering to the design standards, but how do you make sure the roadway is actually safe? For that, we need to be able to make an estimate of traffic safety of how many crashes are we expecting on a road. So that's why all of this analysis of crash rates comes into picture. So the formulas that are gonna be used here actually account for crash rates first. So Crash rates can be obtained, depending upon your context, using two different formulas. The first formula is RMEV, rate per million entering vehicles, crash rate per million entering vehicles. Now, one thing I would say is that we do not like to use the term accidents. Now, this may not be relevant to the FE exam necessarily, but, but, but I work in the area of traffic safety quite a bit, and this is my... This is sort of my pain point uh, when I hear people term use the term accident because the term accident makes me think that, hey, it was an accident. But, but you know, if when you say that, you're basically saying that this is sort of an, 
uh, act of fate. You know, this is something that was always bound to happen. But I reject that premise and, and traffic safety community in general, we reject that premise because we contend that tra crashes are preventable. So we don't want to call them accidents. We always want to call, call them traffic crashes that are happening. So that's a good thing that I'm very happy with the FE manual that even though they use the, the, the parameter A for the number of crashes, they don't call it accident. So they call it crash. They call it number of crashes for A. So capital A stand for number of crashes. And, and I don't like the term accidents here. Okay. So number of crashes total or by type. So you could, you could figure out the rate of crashes by type, or you could figure out the rate of crashes by um, uh, overall. Uh, so that's the number of crashes. Capital V is, and then you, what you're doing is you're basically providing by dividing by V, you're providing a measure of exposure. And exposure is ADT times 365, where ADT is the average daily traffic entering the intersection. So RMEV, it's the crash rate per million vehicle entering vehicles, crash rate per million entering vehicles. So basically what you have, what you have is, let's say if you have an intersection approach like this. So remember I said there are two different types of crash rate, one for intersections and one for roadway segments. So this is the one that's defined for intersection. So let's say the intersection looks like this and you have vehicles entering here. So what you will count is how many vehicles are entering the intersection every year. So you'll take the daily traffic and you multiply that by 365. Okay, so you get the annual entering vehicles. Okay, and then you have this 1 million number at the top because you want to get the unit in per million entering vehicles. So basically what you're counting is how many vehicles are entering the intersection. So basically one-sided traffic from all approach roads. Okay, you want to make sure you're not double counting by taking the total ADT. You're basically doing this. So your all approaches, how many vehicles are entering. Okay, this is a four-legged intersection. Obviously, the definition will be slightly different for three-legged intersection. You just have to count how many cars are entering the intersection on a three-legged one as well. The formula is the same. Crash rate per million entering vehicles is what you'll get from that. And VMT is the vehicle mile traveled. So if you want, uh, so, so, this formula ends here, okay? So where capital V is ADT times 365. The next formula is rate per million vehicle mile traveled. And this is for the roadway segment. So if you take a roadway segment like this, okay, take a roadway segment like this, and let's say this is a certain length of the segment. <coughs> So let's say this length of the road. And then over this segment, the ADT is the average daily traffic. So vehicles that pass through the whole section of the road, that will be your ADT. So rate per million uh, vehicle mile traveled, RMVM, is defined as A times 1 million divided by VMT, vehicle mile traveled. And you start to hear about this VMT more and more, especially in California, where we are starting to use this VMT to make urban planning decisions. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but, but obviously that's beyond the scope of this uh, topic that we are covering here. But VMT is the vehicle miles of travel during a given period. So again, vehicle mile traveled is defined as ADT times number of days in the study period. So average daily traffic times number of days in study period. So if it's 365, if it's the period is one year, you can define that to be 365. And then the length of the road. Again, these denominators VMT and capital V in the above formula, they're measuring what we call the exposure. A roadway that has more exposure, more vehicles coming in, or more vehicles using it, you can expect more crashes there. So this is a way to normalize the number of crashes that have happened. And what we are doing is we are normalizing it and we're calling it the crash rate. And crash rate for intersections is defined at rate per million entering vehicles. And for roadway segments, it's defined as rate per million vehicle miles traveled. Okay. So you're able to estimate how, what is the crash rate? And that's the extent of problems you'll be asked on the crash rates uh, formula. Okay. okay, any questions about this? Okay. 
There are no questions. I will just uh, move on to the last topic. And this is basically the being able to, this is about being able to estimate how many crashes would be avoided if you implemented a series of improvements on your road, okay? If, or your intersection, it could be any, any location on the road. If you implemented a certain amount of improvement or certain type of improvement, let's say you provided better roadway lighting or you provided better lane markings or you converted a stop sign into a traffic signal or you provided rumble steps on a two lane road, okay? So if you made those types of improvement, how many crashes could you expect or how many crashes could you expect to avoid based on those improvements, okay? So the number of crash prevented could be derived using this formula, okay? Where N is the number of crashes if countermeasure is not implemented and if the traffic volume remain the same, okay? So N is the expected crashes if the countermeasures is, are not implemented, if you do nothing, what would have happened, okay? So that's your N and if the traffic volume remained the same, so the crash prevented will be N times CR. CR is crash reduced, or you could say CR is the number of crashes, uh, crash reduction, okay? CR is the overall crash reduction factor, okay? CR is the overall crash reduction factor. But if you implement, and this formula comes in handy, if you have more than one countermeasure, and that is invariably going to be the case when we do certain improvements to the road, just for efficiency purposes, when we repave the road, that's when we try to install a lot of our pavement related countermeasures, like for example, installing rumble strips, right? So if we think that installing rumble strip is a good idea, a lot of time that will get combined with the resurfacing of the road, for example, right? So, so a lot of times, and this formula comes in handy when that is the situation, when you're not just applying one countermeasure, you're applying more than one crash countermeasure or ways to improve the road. And this formula assumes that those countermeasures are independent of each other. So each countermeasure produces a certain crash reduction that is independent of each other. Now that formula or that assumption that those countermeasures are independent of each other may not always be valid. However, for the scope of the FE exam, we will always assume, and it's always gonna be given to you in the problem, that those countermeasures are independent of each other, okay, or mutually exclusive countermeasures. So if the mutually exclusive improvement, so that's what I meant by independent, if the countermeasures are mutually exclusive, CR, the aggregate crash reduction factor, or the overall crash reduction factor, can be given by this formula. CR1 plus one minus CR1 times CR2, plus one minus CR1 minus C1 minus CR2 times CR3, and so on and so forth, up to M, where M is the number of countermeasure that you implement. I don't expect you to see more than three in the exam problems, but if there are, you can easily implement it. But remember, this is the formula you apply. Now, it doesn't matter what you call one, two, and three, as long as you're consistent. If you have three countermeasure, you can assume anyone to be one, two, or three in the numbering. The results should come out the same, no problem but just make sure that you're consistent in what you call one, what you call two, and what you call three. And then you can, based on that, you can esti estimate a total crash reduction factor, and then you could plug in back into the overall formula and estimate how many crashes will be prevented, okay? And how many crashes would be prevented is a useful metric because once you figure out how many crashes you're able to prevent, you can estimate how, what is the benefit, of, uh, you know, because the Federal Highway Administration publishes how much is the cost in terms of dollars for each crash? And then once you know the crash is prevented, you can figure out what is the dollar benefit amount. And then that can help you sometimes do the benefit cost analysis. And, and that kind of can feed back into the engineering economics analysis of safety improvement. And again, engineering economics is something we're gonna talk about, but I just wanna make sure that you understand the context of why we might wanna estimate this crash prevented. And then one last thing, ADT after improvement, ADT before improvement. This is important because if you make improvement, but the ADT goes up by significant amount, you might not see the same amount of crash reduction. Just because sometimes when the exposure goes up, number of crashes go up by itself. 
So you want to account for that. And then you account for that by looking at how much the ADT has changed. If the ADT has gone up, you expect certain crashes to go up by itself. Okay. And then this ratio accounts for that. Okay. So all of these things would be given to you in the problem. And again, we'll try to work out some example problems related to that uh, later. And uh, so, so that, that is basically what I want to do in the next session. My goal will be to, to work out some example problems. I'll stop here for just one second and ask my panelists if there are any questions about the safety analysis. Okay, um, yeah, Jacob, any questions? Uh, no questions. Okay, uh, thank you then. Uh, so this is all I wanted to cover in all the planning, design, and operation side of traffic, save, uh, in traffic analysis and transportation portion. We still have sessions to go on um, pavement design and engineering economics, and, and then uh, working out some problems. So, so we'll work those out in the next session. Uh, I'll thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop the recording now and we'll, and we'll pick it up later.